Hi, everyone. I'm here with Dr. Sean Baker. He's a doctor, an MD, an athlete, a father, and a proponent of carnivore diets and lifestyles. He got his doctor of medicine at Texas Tech Health University, and he completed his orthopedic surgical residency at the University of Texas. He was the chief of orthopedics at various Air Force bases, and he was a lead surgeon in his own private practice until 2016. Uh, he's a distinguished graduate of the U U.S. Air Force Officer Training School, and uh, he had his hand on the nuclear trigger for about five years in the U.S. Air Force. Is that correct, Sean? That's pretty much it. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. I mean, that's something that I was always wondering, like, who are the people who have their hands on the nu these nuclear buttons? Like, how much do we know about them? What, what's the vetting process for these people? Um, yeah, and like, how much control do you actually have? Like, let's say if you just went psycho and you're just like, that's it, I'm pressing the button. How many, how many safeguards are there? Yeah, there's plenty of safeguards. And, and you know, there was actually a pretty significant uh, psychological screening process that you have to go through a lot of training before you're allowed to do that and no one one rogue person could not uh uh you know start world war three <laughs> how many rogue people do you need <laughs> you know I, you know i think that information is probably still top secret so i can oh, probably not... tell you on that. Yeah, we had a top secret clearance and uh, uh you know the way stuff works so um, oh i didn't know that okay I, I don't know what the statute of, of my top secret clearance is so i'm not going to risk that but um more than one person all right. Well, yeah, that was just a topic of curiosity that I've had in the background of my mind for a while. Um, yeah, I mean, John Oliver did a, he did a segment on, you know, how there was like a, a, a nuclear missile that just went missing at one point. It was just interesting. So that kind of brought it to the forefront. Uh, in any case, I want to talk about the carnivore diet. I've, I've already spoken to some people about it such as Paul Saladino, uh, Chris Masterjohn, Michaela Peterson. And uh, yeah, th this diet is very interesting to me because number one is it helped me. But on the other hand, I see kind of, uh, you know, some people uh, promoting different aspects of the diet and, and, you know, promoting different ways of doing the diet. So the way I would promote it is by doing, uh, you know, carnivore diet with supplementation right? Whereas a lot of other people are doing it in a way that is like, well, this is the perfect diet and you don't really need anything, right? And so I'm trying to get an understanding of the different ways that people do it. And then other people are doing uh, nose to tail. And so one, the first question I have is, uh, what got you into a carnivore diet? Yeah, so I mean, why I started started doing a carnivore diet, you know, closing it on three years ago, is just for you know continued self experimentation and looking at improving improving athletic performances. At that point, I had been on a ketogenic diet, ketogenic style diet for a couple of years, and so just reading about some of the athletic performance enhancements of meat in general and steak and eggs as as a diet for body composition. So I looked at that um, and then discovered this community of people you know, doing a carnivore diet uh, and sort of kind of stalked that community for about six months, kind of learning and asking questions. And, uh, you know, and then I finally decided, well, I'm just going to do it for, you know, kind of a short period of time. And so I did a, you know, a week here, two weeks here. And then finally, and then finally I did kind of a 30 day kind of experiment. And at that point I was on uh, social media and had, you know, a little bit of a following there. And we kind of kidded around about, what's going to happen to me in those 30 days? Am I going to get scurvy? Is my heart going to stop beating, you know, getting clogged with cholesterol or, you know, is my colon going to fall out from the lack of fiber? And so that's how I started, um, you know, into that after, after I'd say about a six or seven year journey of, you know, playing with nutrition in order to improve my health and then ultimately improve athletic performance. What kind of health issues did you have? Yeah, so I mean, I had been an athlete my whole life, and I've you know I've I've been a actually a very high level athlete, uh, you know, since I was very 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 young. And uh, even though I was still training extremely hard and still doing very well athletically, I was seeing that I was developing, uh, you know, in retrospect, uh, signs and symptoms of metabol metabolic disease. And so, 
um, probably some sleep apnea, some hypertension. I was probably holding more weight than I needed to things. You know, I had, you know, just aches and pains and, you know, things that you normally associate with just, you know, an athlete that's been through the ringer for several decades and just getting older. And so those are the things that I was kind of uh, dealing with. No dramatic illnesses or anything like that. Kind of the normal, I'm getting older and, and don't feel as good type of thing that we see so commonly, which we consider kind of normal aging, which, you know, in retrospect is, is clearly not normal aging, but that's what I was dealing with. And so that's what incentivized me to experiment. Do you think you would have been helped by a carnivore diet if you weren't an athlete or since you had all these injuries and maybe you had leaky gut and you got sensitive to a bunch of things that that's why the carnivore diet helped you? Do I think it would have been helped if I wasn't an athlete? Uh, yeah, I mean, I do. I mean, I think the majority of the people that have started on this diet, in fact, the community that I discovered had really no athletes in that community. It was almost all people that, you know, were kind of people suffering from actually pretty significant disease and probably, you know, probably leaky gut contribute to it, you know, in, in some way. And so I think the majority of people that have done this in the past have not been athletes and the, you know, the kind of more... Uh, widespread adaptation by people doing athletics is, is a really recent phenomenon. Do you think that your cognitive function improved by this diet? <laughs> well, there's clearly people that would, that would say no, not at all. And, and they think I'm completely crazy. But um, I would say, you know, I, I didn't notice a huge improvement in cognition relative to where I was on a ketogenic diet. And so I think, you know, perhaps compared to you know, a standard American diet or a more high carbohydrate based diet than, than probably so. But I didn't see a dramatic shift in that particular aspect going from a ketogenic diet to a carnivorous diet. Interesting. And uh, can you explain exactly what your diet is like? Um, and do you eat eggs? And just, yeah, explain what your diet is like. Yeah, if you were to take my, like my diet for the month, I would say 95% of it would come from some sort of red meat, typically a steak or, or you know, hamburger, I'd say the remaining 5% would be made up of, you know, typically seafood, eggs, and some dairy. And, 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 you know, occasionally I'll use a little bit of, you know, mostly salt, but sometimes there'll be seasoning on the food. And that would, you know, that would represent the, the vast majority of my diet. Um, very, very rarely I've had uh, occasions where like, you know, my son had a birthday when he turned six and he had a birthday cake and he wanted me to try a piece. And so I had a piece of cake, but that was just a, you know, kind of a very one-off type of situation. And so, uh, the diet is pretty pretty much exclusively animal based. Um, you know, I, I I really haven't had fruit or vegetables in a couple of years now. You know, or grains or any of that stuff outside of like I said, a piece of cake on on rare occasion. Interesting, interesting. And so the the main aspect, ninety five percent. What I find very interesting is that ninety five percent of it is just steak. Is that because you like steak, or you just think it's healthier than, you know, the, the seafood, chicken, or other things? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's two things going on. One, I certainly prefer it, um, and I think that is consistent with what we probably, have, you know, as much of our human evolution. I mean, I don't dislike chicken or seafood or any of those other things. Uh, it's just that when I, when I sort of compare how I feel in, in my level of satiation or satisfaction after those other foods, it doesn't seem to stack up to what I get with, uh, you know, a ruminant animal, particularly, you know, a fattier cut of red meat. I think that is probably consistent with what humans, you know, probably subsisted on for much of our evolutionary development, you know, for, for probably well over a million years. Interesting. So you're, you're, you're basing the diet mainly on an evolutionary point of view. You're, you're saying like, since well, no, this I'm is not... how I think evolutionary, evolutionarily we're supposed to be eating, then that's why I'm eating that way. I mean, and also obviously your personal success, right? Yeah, I mean, I think the base results on personal personal results. I mean, that's how we should base any any diet. Now, why I think I'm getting the results I am getting is probably grounded in, in you know, in, in evolutionary uh, theory or plausibility. So, I mean, it's, again, at the end of the day, it's doing what's working you know, best for you personally. And you don't get those same satiation effects from seafood or chicken. It's mainly steak that you, you're finding really helps you eat less. 
Yeah, I would say that's a fair statement. Uh, you know, I can't say that uh, I've sat there and measured quantities of trying to eat chicken. I mean, it just doesn't, you know, after a bit, it just loses its appeal, you know, and, and I don't know that it's because I'm satiated. It's just because it doesn't taste very good anymore. So, you know, particularly if it's, if it's you know, and a lot of times a problem with, with chicken or fish is it tends to be too lean, you know, you know, outside of certain, you know, parts of the chicken. But I mean, for the most part, um, it just doesn't have the appeal, you know, just from a, you know, taste standpoint. I see. And, and do you think the reason why you're losing weight is, you know, some researchers, their theory of why limiting foods can be helpful is because it causes you to eat less calories. So there's a palatability theory where if you eat less foods and you get used to that, you're not going to eat as much calories. Do you think that that has a role? I think there's a number of factors that are going on why some people are having success with, with uh, losing weight. Um, I mean, there are certainly people that gain weight and include, including gaining body fat and doing this. So I don't think that is a universally uh, accepted, well, I wouldn't say accepted truth, but I would say that it doesn't hold up in all people. Um, I think that the reason that many people lose weight or, or tend to is, yeah, yes, the meat can be very satiate, satiating, whether it's the protein or the fat content, some people argue the fat content is more, more satiation and therefore they eat lower, you know, less calories overall. I mean, I think there's certainly that, 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 that seems to occur for some people. We also know that protein is a very forgiving macronutrient with regard to fat gain. That is to say that there are a number of studies out there looking at uh, protein overfeeding. Uh, Jose Antonio has done several of those studies looking at when they feed uh, people excess amounts of protein, maybe as much as 200 grams per day. They don't seem to gain any additional body fat. They hang hang on to their lean body mass. And again, this this particular research population was done in people doing resistance training, and so that may be some of the difference that we see in that. But I also think that uh, I I do think that you know we can impact our metabolic rate and metabolic efficiency through many things: exercise, sleep. And I do think diet does play a role in that, particularly early on, where some people will notice that they can actually eat more calories than they were and see that they're losing weight. And I think that eventually starts to plateau. And I think that ultimately caloric consumption does play a role in, you know, gaining or losing weight. I don't think anybody would, well, I don't dispute that, but I think there are some other factors that kind of modify that, particularly when people are in, you know, in flux with, with their metabolic efficiency and their insulin sensitivity and some of these other factors. But yeah, you're right. If, if you're only eating a mono diet and you find the food to be very bland, uh, you may be less inclined to overeat that. You know, I personally do not find, you know, ribeye steaks or anything else bland. In fact, I can, I can eat a heck of a lot of that if I want to. And you don't consume it with any uh, oils or fats like olive oil or um, butter or anything like that? Typically not, not for, not for something like a ribeye steak because it's already so fatty that I don't find that I need to add any fat to, to, to cook it. You know, I think if I cook some seafood, like, like I'll have shrimp occasionally and then I'll usually cook that in typically in butter. I mean, just because it's, it's hard to cook shrimp without any kind of fat with it, you know, uh, you know, at least in, in the pan. But I mean, I do a lot of, most of my stuff is done, you know, over, over a grill for the most part. So I haven't found a need to add fat to those types of things. And I, I, you know, when I was early on, I used to put butter on top of the steaks as a, you know, as a flavor enhancement, but I found that over, over time, I just didn't really find that to be necessary. And let's say if you rolled the clock back and you're in your 20s, would you start this diet or you didn't have any kinds of issues that would have been helped by this diet in your 20s? So maybe you think that it's something that you should only do later on if you have issues? You know, I think that um, from an athletic standpoint, because I was an athlete my, you know, my whole life, I, I think I would have definitely benefited from dramatically increasing the amount of meat I ate, you know, relative to other things. And probably, I think in that situation, probably I would have, you know, again, if I could go back 25 years ago, and, and, and I would say I was probably eating, you know, a diet that was 90% 90, 90 carnivorous, and I was using you know, other foods for, for different particular, you know, training, training advantages, you know, if it, if it wasn't, you know, if it wasn't a net negative. And so I would say that for many people, and, and, and you know, the majority of the people that end up doing this diet for a prolonged period of time, 
the majority of the people still find that they feel good getting a majority of their calories coming from, you know, animal source nutrition. So it's typically things like steak. When you're in these forums, what, what do you see the most common reason why people are doing this diet? Um, I, I, I think, you know, weight loss is probably the most common reason. I mean, it's probably closely followed by, um, you know, particular uh, health concerns, whether it's diabetes, autoimmune diseases, skin diseases, gastrointestinal problems. And then I think third of that would be people that are interested in, you know, athletic performance. Interesting. Composition, that sort of stuff. Interesting. And, um, and so are you not afraid of nutrient deficiencies? And if not, then why? Um, I'm not afraid of it in the context of what I'm eating. I think it's very important. I think nutrient deficiencies are something that, that significantly impact many people. In fact, most people probably are uh, malnourished to some degree, even obese people. Um, so, I mean, there's, you know, to answer that question, I think it's very important and I am concerned about that. However, I don't feel that the diet I'm on, I am on currently is putting me at significant risk for that. I mean, you know, outside of the fact that when we look at what the RDA shows, but I, I think there's uh, some significant problems with utilizing the RDA in this particular situation based on how the RDA was developed. And what are you, what's your issue with the way that the RDA was developed that you don't believe in the reference ranges that they get? Well, I think the reference ranges apply to people eating a specific type of diet. And so the RDA reference ranges were largely developed on people eating a grain-based, you know, uh, relatively high carbohydrate diet. Uh, we know uh, even uh, the Institute of Medicine in, 20, in 2007, you know, had a huge meeting on RDAs. And the uh, conclusion from that meeting was the RDAs were based on the lowest level of evidence possible, which was merely just expert opinion. And so we don't have really robust science, you know, demonstrating exactly what humans need. I mean, even, even, even the RDA itself, you know, assuming everyone's eating the same diet, it's still largely guesswork. And so certainly when we have people that are eating a completely different diet that has likely different requirements and different um, efficiencies, um, compared to a plant-based, carbohydrate-based diet, then I think the RDAs become um, very much, you know, not necessarily accurate for, for this population. Mm -hmm. And so are, you're not, even, even if you don't believe in the RDAs, um, you're not concerned that you might be deficient in something? Like, because you're still doing something that is, you know, um, a deviation from the norm. And whenever you're deviating from the norm, you have a higher risk of doing something that is outside of that norm, right? Um, including any kind of low level deficiency that, you know, you might be aware of, or you might not be aware of. Is that a concern at all for you? Yeah, I mean, I certainly would agree with your contention that deviation from what we consider normal practices certainly changes your you know, risk stratification, I would say. Um, so I would say then what would be my, what would, what would be the anticipated clinical manifestation of such potential nutri nutrient deficiencies? And so as far as I know, nutrient deficiencies do not equate to breaking world records in sports, do not equate to being six foot five, 250 pounds of, you know, lean muscle, uh, being able to dunk basketballs and do back flips and, you know, effortlessly preserve muscle mass in your 50s without drugs or, or hormones. And so I would say you'd be hard pressed to make an argument that I'm nutrient deficient uh, based on those things. I mean, there's, you know, I mean, what, what happens to people when they get nutrient deficient? They get sick, they get weak, they lose weight, um, they have health issues. And, and as I've got basically none of those things, and I only continue to get stronger, faster and better, despite, you know, being in an age where most people aren't doing what I'm doing. I would say that the nutrient deficient arg deficiency argument starts to become less and less uh, likely. So you're, you're taking the approach of if I don't display symptoms for something and I'm achieving peak performance in various ways, then I have nothing to worry about. I think that's, I think that's fair to say. I mean, if you, if we look back, you know, let's define, let's talk about some nutrient deficiency. So there's a disease called beriberi, which is a thiamine deficiency. And this was looked at 
you know, back, you know, the early 1900s, and we saw that um, certain animals, if we, you know, make them deficient in thiamine, and we get their thiamine, blood, you know, serum thiamine levels down to a certain level, they will develop the disease. They will develop the clinical manifestations of very, very, which are either cardiovascular or, neuro or neurological. Now, if we take that same set of animals and we feed them a low carbohydrate diet and also keep their serum levels very low, these people do not develop this, the clinical manifestations of the disease. And so it becomes very interesting. I think that's why it's so important to have, you know, a theoretical potential problem and then an actual clinical problem. And so if you can't show me an actual clinical problem, then I'm going to have a hard time saying that this is a, this is a real problem. This is a deficiency. Um, having said that, most people, and I have not done extensive testing on hair analysis and mineral analysis and all that stuff. I think it's superfluous and I don't think it's going to particularly change what I do, but I have seen many, many, many people's laboratory results and I've yet to see any kind of pattern that would suggest, which would suggest, you know, issues with, with, with deficiencies, whether, whether clinical or, you know, serological. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of theory, would you agree that, um, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of arguments you can make about whether you would need more or less nutrients on different diets, right? And so they are testing these nutrients on a given diet. Um, but just from a theoretical perspective, you can, you can make arguments that say that you might need more of a nutrient if you're on a carnivore diet or less of a nutrient, right? It could go both ways. I mean, disregarding the clinical aspects of it. I'm just talking about theoretically. Yeah, I mean, I guess theoretically anything's possible. Then I would look at uh, what, what are the known mechanisms that we know that, that make our nutrient requirements go up or down. And most of that uh, that we know, um, you know, if we look at, you know, a standard diet, which is rich in, you know, plants and grains and fiber, all of those things contain what we call anti-nutrients. All of those things tend to uh, bind, uh, you know, particularly minerals like calcium, iron, zinc, uh, and others, magnesium, for example. So we know the mechanisms exist to make nutrition more challenging when we're eating those foods. We don't, have, I'm not aware of any similar mechanisms that make it more difficult when we're on a meat-based diet. In fact, it's, it's generally the opposite. So in theory, there might be some nutrient that, that, that is harder to get on a meat-based diet, but at least I'm not aware of it yet. And I mean, you know, even like there's, you know, some people make an argument about folate levels being low or having difficulty with folate where we have to realize that about 80% of our folate comes from a microbiome. And we see that people that are on a carnivore diet tend to see an increase in microorganisms that produce folate. And so we have this com compensatory mechanism. And so well, you're right. Theoretically, uh, anything's possible. Uh, it's possible that uh, the diet that most of us are on are, is the less appropriate diet. And many people, like we can look at magnesium, magnesium deficiency is fairly ubiquitous. Uh, magnesium is a cofactor found in carbohydrate metabolism. And therefore, you know, if you're on a carbohydrate-based diet, you are requiring more magnesium. Also, you're probably eating foods that in interfere with the absorption of magnesium. And so that's probably one of the reasons why magnesium deficiency is so prominent in the, you know, in the general population. And we don't see that in a carnivore population typically. Interesting. So do you supplement with any nutrients? Uh, if you consider salt a supplement, then I, then I put salt in my food or, or, and sometimes I'll put it in water. And, uh, but that's the extent of any supplementation that I would do. And what about organ meats? Do you eat organ meats? Not typically. I mean, I've had them. I have them occasionally. You know, if I'm out typically when I'm traveling and someone offers them to me, I'll eat them. But I mean, I don't make them for myself. I would say probably one tenth of 1% of my food comes from organ meats. So I don't really, I'm not too concerned about that. I mean, there's obviously they're very nutrient rich. Obviously, there's some benefits, potential benefits for eating them. I think there are certain people that uh, will benefit from that. I, I haven't found that I can make a general recommendation that all people need to eat organ meats. I've done this diet as I've observed, you know, literally thousands of people doing this diet now and a very high percentage of them do very well, you know, in the absence of any, any regular amount of organ meat. So uh, I, I don't doubt that there are specific situations, you know, traditional populations will often say they've reserved organ meats for 
you know, young infants and elderly people or pregnant women in special circumstances when they might have an increasing requirements for nutrients. But I think perhaps for, you know, the average sort of person that's kind of healthy and doing well, they may be completely, you know, superfluous. Interesting. And how long have you uh, been doing this diet for? Uh, I've been doing the diet a little over two and a half years, probably coming into, you know, two years and seven months or something like that. And at what point do you feel you leveled off with the benefits that you got from the diet? Or do you still find that there's improving benefits over time? Um, I'm still seeing some benefit, particularly with regard to athletic performance. And so that is where, I'm, you know, I, I've seen, you know, pretty much I'm pain free. I don't have any joint muscle pains or ache pain, aching pains that I had before. I mean, my digestion's fine. My sleep's fine. I mean, I don't know. My libido's fine. I mean, everything, you know, that I would expect what I would look at subjectively is doing very well. And the only thing I have left right now objectively is, is sort of athletic output. And that's still on the, on the upside. And I've, I've talked to people that have done this diet for, you know, five years, 10 years, or even 20 years. And they say that for most people, they, they tend to see improvements for about three to five years. And I think maybe some of that has to do with the fact that, you know, many of the compounds that we eat, you know, particularly things like industrial seed oil take up residence in our tissue and the half-life for that can be a couple of years to finally, you know, get that liberated from your body. And so it may take several years to kind of get all that kind of garbage that's accumulated out of there. And so that's, that's what I'm seeing at this point. Interesting. Do you think this diet is for everyone or do you think that you should only like this diet is mainly for people who are athletes, who have specific issues, or, or whatnot? You know, I think the diet is likely to be beneficial for most people. I think the vast majority of people would do well with that. Do I think the vast majority of people need to do it? Most likely not. I mean, I think that uh, there's a lot of ways for people to get healthy on many different types of diets. Um, I think that uh, all human beings generally have a very good capacity, particularly well, I'll put, I'll, let me just, I'll put a caveat to that. People that have a normal digestive system, and many of us don't, but people with a normal human digestive system are very well suited to live on a meat-rich diet, meat-heavy diet, and maybe it's, you know, 100% carnivorous or 90% carnivorous. And I think most people would do well with that. Um, there are people that have significant digestive challenges that uh, they may find that, that the diet becomes challenging without you know, without supplementation and without uh, perhaps time to adapt to it properly. And, you know, like I said, there's people, whether socially or culturally or financially, where, where this is, you know, not practical. Um, and certainly there's, there's that. And, you know, and, and, you know, a lot of people like talking about how do you feel feed 9 billion people on one diet? I mean, it's, that's really a straw man argument. There's no, there's no diet that every one of us is going to eat regardless. I mean, most people on the planet barely can get food anyway. And so they'll eat whatever they can get. And so it's not like everybody has, you know, a huge choice. The same thing with veganism. I mean, there's no uh, places in the world outside of highly developed wealthy countries where it's even discussed because it's, it's just not even a concept that most people would even have, a, have the luxury to think about. Mm -hmm. And do you, when you're eating your steaks, are they always grass fed or you don't really care that much about it? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think that there are a lot of reasons to support regenerative agriculture. I think there are, um, you know, a lot of, and I do promote that, and I'm, and I'm very, uh, very passionate about trying to um, support the guys that are doing that. I do think that needs to become an increasingly important part of our um, agricultural system. I think people need to directly purchase from those producers. Having said that, um, and again, I'm trying to be as honest as possible, and, and again, having observed thousands upon thousands of people do the diet, I've seen equal results, you know, for the most part for people doing grain-finished beef, cheap, cheap beef versus, you know, high-end grass-finished beef. And so I don't think the human health component is the major compelling reason to choose that. Now, certainly there are individuals who will say, I definitely do better on grass-finished beef, and Conversely, there are people that say I do better on grain finished beef. And so uh, I, I, again, I, I try to be as um, honest as I possibly can. And whereas, I mean, it could very easy for me to say you have to eat organ meats and you have to use grass finished beef to have success on the diet. That would be disingenuous of me. And I think that would probably 
exclude a lot of people that could not otherwise afford that to attempt in this diet. And I think that's, that's, that's unfair and not helpful to a large percent of the people that, you know, probably could be benefited from it. I see. And do you yourself eat grass fed um, or you don't really care or? I eat a mixture of both. Um, okay. I eat, you know, sometimes grass fed, sometimes grain finished. Uh, yeah, I like them both. Um, you know, I've got, at this point, as I've become quite an advocate and, you know, I have a little bit of following uh, a lot of ranchers, they, they send me their meat. <laughs> they just send it to me to try. And so I'll, I'll eat, you know, what people send me off and, and, you know, sometimes it's grass fed, sometimes it's not. Um, I honestly can't say I notice a huge difference personally with, with, with either type. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so when it comes to diets, what other diets have you tried out? Yeah. So, um, I mean, I, for years I ate a, you know, quote unquote food pyramid diet. You know, I, ate, uh, I mean, I certainly ate some junk food, but it certainly it never made up the large majority of the diet. I've always had a diet rich in fruits and vegetables and low fat dairy and pastas and grains and cereals and, you know, a small amount of junk food and, and sweets and stuff like that. That was most of my life. And I always felt that as long as I trained hard, I could eat kind of whatever I wanted as long as I, you know, worked hard in the gym. And that worked, you know, reasonably well or, or what I thought worked reasonably well. In retrospect, there are probably things happening with my health that were attributed to diet that I would have probably avoided had I not done that. But, you know, then as I got into, you know, figuring out that the diet, you know, that type of diet wasn't working anymore, then I, then I started on a uh, very low-fat, um, plant-rich, lean-protein diet. Um, and I definitely lost weight doing that got leaner uh but just didn't feel very good i mean i just i just just, just didn't feel good at all doing that you know and, and after about i think about four or five six months i said i can't do this anymore and then i how did I you not feel good you didn't have energy you had yeah, i mean i was always i was always hungry i was i was in a in kind of a not a pleasant mood i was i was <laughs> you know, a little bit not having a lot of energy you know it's okay. just uh kind of you have was, inflammation um, I don't recall having a lot of inflammation at that time. I think it was just more, I was hungry all the time. And that's not a, I don't think it's a sustainable way for anybody to be hungry constantly. And so that's, that's challenging. And so then I went from that to a kind of a more paleo style diet, um, did that for several years and then, then kind of morphed into, you know, a low carbohydrate approach. And then finally got into a, you know, a ketogenic diet, which I did for a couple of years. And then, and then finally switching over to this, you know, this carnivore cell diet. And how did you do on a paleo diet? Um, you know, I did pretty well. I mean, I felt pretty decent. Um, I, I, you know, I, I felt certainly more satiated than I did on the low fat, you know, vegetable heavy diet. Um, but I was still eating, you know, paleo diet. I was still eating huge salads and, but including more animal products, and a little bit more fat in the diet. And, uh, I can't say I felt bad on that diet. It's just that, you know, as I continued to kind of study about nutrition and try to try to refine things. I, I kind of progressed away from that. Mm -hmm. And so between a paleo diet, the paleo diet was definitely better than the standard healthy American diet that the associations advocate. And then also uh, better for you than the low fat. How did it compare to the low carb and the keto? You know, I think that, uh, you know, I, I think the, the ketogenic style diet was the first time I, I, I saw a change in hunger patterns, you know, where I was, you know, I, I didn't feel hungry anymore, you know, and with, with a paleo diet, I mean, I enjoyed the food. I didn't feel bad. I didn't feel like I was missing out on fat, but I still would get hunger, you know, regular hunger, you know, basically probably glucose based, insulin based hunger signals. And when I went on it, you know, mostly the ketogenic diet, that changed pretty significant to me. So that was a major difference there. Interesting. And so how did that, um, how did that compare to the carnivore diet? So the keto, the keto diet was the best diet you were on out of all the other diets, except the carnivore diet. How did that compare to the carnivore diet? And are you in ketosis right now in terms of when you're on the carnivore diet? Yeah. So, I mean, as far as comparison, I think the aspect of hunger was best on a ketogenic diet. I don't know that, you know, body composition or performance was any better on a ketogenic diet versus say a paleo diet. Uh, when I went to a carnivore diet, I felt that I had the benefits of both of those things, because I think one of the problems with one of my thoughts 
or problems around a ketogenic diet is it tends to undervalue protein, particularly in athletes. And I think that's one nice thing about, you know, being on a carnivore style diet is you, you don't lack for protein. You don't lack for essential amino acids. You don't lack for carnitine, carnosine, creatine, some of those things that are, that are shown to be, you know, healthy and, and also, you know, performance enhancing. Um, as far as ketosis is concerned, it's going to vary. I don't, I was never one that was constantly obsessed with checking ketone levels. So I didn't really care because at the end of the day, I'm more concerned with, you know, clinical endpoints. So how am I functioning? What is my body composition doing? How do I feel? How are my major body systems performing? So I didn't really get into to measuring ketones. Now, having said that, um, you know, I could taste ketones on my breath, you know, when I was on a carnivore diet, particularly early on as I was, I was adapting to it. And as I find that, you know, when I, you know, depending on my meal frequency, depending on how fatty I eat, I mean, I, I'm probably in and out of ketosis. And, and again, I don't, I don't particularly track it because it's not something that I obsess about. I don't want, I don't need the anxiety to worry about how many millimolars of ketones I'm making because I don't really quite, quite honestly don't, I, I don't frankly care. And I know that, you know, it's really clinically not that important for, for what I'm trying to do. Now, having seen, again, lots and lots of lab results on people on a carnivore diet, many, many of them do spend quite a bit of time in ketosis. Interesting. And what do you, is longevity a topic that you care about or? Yeah, sure it is. Yeah. I mean, and, I don't want to die early. I've got young kids. I'd like to see them get old and grow strong and see their grand, my grandchildren and stuff like that. So absolutely. I don't want to shorten my life and I'm not planning on doing this. And I don't, you know, I, I'm not doing this to shorten my life, but also I think health span is incredibly important and I don't want to, I don't want to roll into my sixties and seventies as some decrepit person that can't, uh, you know, can't be independent. And so I think you have to balance both of those concerns. And I think a long, uh, long, healthy life is better than an extra long sickly life. Right. Do you think the carnivore diet is optimal for longevity or do you think it's optimal for health and like health span, not necessarily longevity, but the trade-off is worth it? I don't know that anyone will ever be able to answer that question. I mean, I certainly don't know for sure. I mean, I think that the best I can say is your health today is going to be the most likely, highly correlate with your health tomorrow. And so I think that we know that um, one of the best predictors for longevity uh, is maintaining strength. And so uh, I find that a carnivore diet is one of the best ways that I've ever found to maintain strength. And so maintaining lean muscle mass and strength is, is a very important aspect for longevity. Now there are concerns around protein and mTOR and we can talk about that topic because I'm, you know, at least I've got some pretty decent understanding about how that, that impacts longevity. And, uh, you know, I think this is uh, something that is very confusing to most people. Sure. We can talk about protein and mTOR. Do you combine this diet with fasting or no? Um, I mean, effectively, yes. Um, I mean, but it's not intentional. I think what happens is, and I, and I do feel that there is some benefit to infrequent meal patterns. I think that uh, we, as a society in general, eat far too frequently. We have a snacking culture, which has you know, basically been created by the processed food companies, and we're constantly eating. I think that is absolutely horrible for our health and probably horrible for you know, you know, trying to live a long life. So while I don't intentionally um, set out a fasting schedule, my natural hunger signals, you know, based on what I'm eating, tends to have me eating in a pattern where I only eat twice a day, probably 90% of the time. And usually it's, you know, I might eat a breakfast around seven, eight o'clock, and then I have a dinner around five, five or 6 p.m. And that's it. That's my day. And so I probably have a, you know, 12. What time do you eat breakfast? You know, it depends on, you know, some days it's eight, some days it's nine. It just depends. So you'll eat breakfast and dinner? Breakfast and dinner, yeah. Typically, and you'll skip I'd say lunch. that's 90% of how my pattern falls into. So mm -hmm. that, that's what I do. I see. You don't, you don't do the uh, – and you're doing that based on your hunger patterns rather than any kind of theoretical optimization. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't find, you know, I, I don't find that, you know, artificially setting some window – is 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 beneficial to me i mean you know think about it plausibly i don't think there's a magic clock that resets exactly 18 hours after you had your last meal i think it's going to vary day to day i think 
you know, if we look at any other animal in the world, I mean, they eat when they're hungry. And I think if you're eating a species appropriate diet, um, then there's a reason you're hungry. Now, if you're eating, a, if you're eating the wrong diet, you're going to be hungry constantly because what's happening is you are basically eating food that doesn't, doesn't supply you with appropriate nutrition, appropriate nutrients. And so you're constantly hungry and continuing to put in this calorie rich food that has very low nutritional quality. Uh, that's different than eating a diet that supplies a high quantity of bioavailable nutrition. Uh, at that point, you know, you, you know, you've got to account for the, you know, the 2% of your muscle mass that turns over every day and the bone turnover and the skin turnover and the organ turnover. And so I think at that point, eating intuitively sort of makes the most sense. So why are you not concerned about excess mTOR activation? Uh, well, I, cause I don't think I'm, ex I don't think I'm experiencing excess mTOR activation. And so if we look at uh, mTOR, it is, you know, while protein, uh, particularly proteins like leucine, are a requirement for mTOR, mTOR activation. It is required. It requires a number of things to to have that occur. And so one of those things is insulin. And so if you are on a low carbohydrate diet, um, and it also depends on the frequency of mTOR activation. And, and we also know that mTOR is activated differentially in different tissues. And so if you're eating a higher protein diet like I'm doing, and you're doing resistance training. Typically, what you'll see in resistance training also will, will stimulate the activation of mTOR because the reason is it will cause mTOR activation in the muscles, and we need that plus protein and some amount of insulin to allow for muscle protein synthesis, which is very important for longevity. We want to maintain strength, and that's one way to do that. And so, if you are not constantly spiking insulin, and again, I'm only eating twice a day, then you're not seeing insulin, you're not seeing mTOR activation in other tissues like peripheral fat liver tissue and other places where things like cancer would become an issue. And so it's, it's not as, it's not a sort of mTOR is not a, you know, on off switch for the whole body. It, it has, it has variable expression. Um, if you give the drug rapamycin, which, you know, you know, just root, just basically, you know, blankets all mTOR production down. What we tend to see in people that have done that is they start to begin to become sarcopenic. And so it's not about, you know, it's not a, it's not a black and white, you know, we never want to see insulin. We never want to see mTOR. It's just that we don't want to see it frequently, you know, uh, being frequently stimulated in the wrong tissues. Right. That's, that's a really good point. So mTOR in your muscles is a good thing, right? That's associated with longevity, having muscle mass, whereas mTOR in other places might cause aging. Yeah, and the same thing with the brain, mTOR in the brain. brain that is, that's, that's, that's uh, you know, um, associated with improved cognition. And so right. we, we want to we stimulate where, where we stimulate it. And it's like anything. We learn some new fact, you know, like we thought, every, you know, at one point it was insulin's bad, so therefore we need to keep our insulin all the time low as possible by eating nothing but fat. Again, it's more, our body is more nuanced than that. It's more complicated than that. And so there's no compound that we have in our body that's universally always bad or necessarily always good. I think there is, you know, I mean, there's reasons why those things are there. And so we, as we learn a little bit, same thing with the microbiome, we're learning a little bit about this and we're making these wide, broadly applied assumptions, which, you know, are more nuanced, nuanced than that. Yeah, especially things as critical as mTOR and insulin, there's obviously, um, these things have so many different interactions in the body. They're obviously very important in a bunch of ways. Now, the last thing I want to get to is lab tests. Are you into lab tests? Do you do them? Uh, do you, you know, check if you're in the optimal range for stuff or you just think that I feel great. I don't need to do that stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think that lab testing has, has its place. I think we overvalue it. I think many of us are unable to interpret it correctly and given the clinical context, you know, as a physician, I've seen, you know, literally tens of thousands of labs and sometimes they're outside of normal range and you have to use your clinical judgment and say, does this actually matter? Is this clinically lining up with what we see? We have to remember that many labs have tremendous diurnal variation, you know, things like vitamin D, for instance, you know, your vitamin D levels can swing 30% throughout the day. And so it depends on the time of day you've had it. There are a lot of things acutely going on that can impact lab values, like things like C-reactive protein, which is an acute phase reactant. It can be elevate, elevated simply for the reason that you worked out hard that week. And so we have to put these things in clinical context. And so I, I see so many people where they'll get their labs once every six months or once a year, 
and they'll see one lab goes up or down one particular way and then they'll you know they'll they'll completely freak out about what they're doing and i think you know you have to look at what are sort of big picture chronic indicators of health and i think you know some of the labs can have some benefit but i would prefer people do things you know depending on your age things like a coronary artery calcium scan or looking at cardiac risk rather than, than blood lipids I'd, I'd see simple measures like waist to height you know measurements i mean that is a tremendous tool for showing what's going on i, I do not see you know, while as people, many, many people debate the significance of certain labs and how applicable they are, there's not many people out there saying that having a high amount of visceral fat or a large amount of, you know, large belly is ever a good thing. And so right. I, I think there are, there are, um, you know, I think labs serve a purpose, particularly in acute settings. You know, if somebody comes into the hospital and they're, they're in distress. I mean, you want to see what's going on. Are they bleeding to death? What's their hemoglobin? Are their electrolytes way out of the whack? Are they in a diabetic coma? Sure, they have a use for that, but I mean, I think in the chronic setting, we tend to overinterpret them or overinterpret the significance of them and and sort of use them. Some people like it's an absolute travesty that we'll have a person come to a doctor's office, get one test, uh, and shows an elevated LDL, and they'll be put on a statin for the rest of their life. I mean, that to me is, I mean, that is not how to you know practice medicine in a, in a very effective manner. It's it's a disservice to people, and so. While I don't think labs are necessarily, um, you know, the, the 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 thing we have to we have to sort of rely on for everything, I, they do have some role. Yeah, I think um, I, I yeah I think labs definitely have a role, but they need to be seen in context. And um, yeah, I, I think a lot of people don't really know what's working for them. So I think if people don't really know what's working for them, then the labs would have a stronger role, right? If you, if you have like specific problems and you're like, well, this is curing all my issues and there's clear signs that I'm benefiting from this, right? Inflammation's going down. Uh, my waist is being reduced, right? Uh, my muscles are being increased. So that, that would, um, that would, uh, you know, outweigh any kind of, studies related to labs i think right but well, i think i think if, if you can corroborate you know like i said if you're if you've got achy joints and, and and horrible gut distress and you know a lot of pain and, and you know swelling and you're clearly inflamed clinically and you get some labs in a lab show yes you're also inflamed in in a, in a laboratory sense i mean you can you can watch those go in tandem and you can see as my as my clinical symptoms get better my lab values get better and that can corroborate what's going on but at the same time you might have a, you might have one discordant lab that's elevated or too low for whatever reason and we got to remember the reference ranges it can be can be different for different particular people i mean there's you know women reference ranges african-american refer, reference ranges and things like gfr are different there's there's different ranges for different sets of people. And there's no reason to think that people pursuing, you know, a different dietary um, regimen might have a different reference range as well. I mean, the thyroid hormones are a classic one where we see often see people that will have a low T3 number and their doctor will be concerned about that, but the patient is cl clinically completely normal. And then in that situation, there's probably no reason to pursue thyroid hormone supplementation because it's very likely that you know, maybe a low carbohydrate diet decreases the requirement for thyroid hor thyroid hormone. And so, uh, you know, I, we just have to put it. We, we and most most physicians don't understand this, and you know, and then the general population definitely doesn't understand this. And so it becomes, um, you know, and one of the problems is there's so many people have access to their own labs now they can just randomly pick out a set of labs, and they don't they really don't know what to do with that. Right. Well, yeah, we have a, we actually, um, I found that a service that helps people interpret their labs. So it gives them the studies showing correlations, but, you know, often it can help to look at the information with a physician. If they don't look at it, if they only look at it with a physician, all, you know, most of the time physicians won't notice anything. Um, if they look at it alone, often, you know, they, they might take things out of context. So I agree with that regard. Okay. Um, it was great speaking to you, Sean. It's, uh, you have a lot of interesting ideas and uh, opinions, and uh, it's been very interesting. Where, where can people learn more about you? 
Yeah, I'm fairly active on social media. I'm, uh, you know, on Instagram, I'm Sean, S-H-A-W-N-B-A-K-E-R-1967. I spent some time on Twitter, S Baker MD. Um, we've got some interesting uh, number of case reports or testimonials on meatheels.com, which, you know, kind of categorizes people that have gone on carnivore style diets and, you know, basically resolved a whole host of medical issues. And it's kind of categorized by, you know, arthritis, obesity, autoimmune diseases, psoriasis, so on and so forth. Um, Sean-Baker.com is a website with, I have a number of links on there. I've got a book coming out, uh, The Carnivore Diet by Sean Baker. It should be out. In August, it's available for pre-order on Amazon and BarnesandNobles.com right now. Uh, we are getting ready to launch AnimalBasedNutritionNetwork.com, which is going to bring together all, kind of all players from the community, including you know physicians, healthcare providers, uh, meat producers, cattle ranchers, you know people into regenerative agriculture, uh, people interested in uh, you know adopting the diet and some health coaching. Uh, and experts to do that. We've got uh, uh, stuff on education, some you know research, a research resource for people that are wanting to find out some of the research behind this stuff. And also, we're going to promote doing research on the diet. Uh, we're going to have uh, you know recipe section. We're going to have people that want to sort of direct public policy to sort of support uh, animal-based food. As we're seeing, we're being directed further and further down this processed food, plant-based, um, um, you know, there's a big push for that. So we, we want to have a strong sort of counter message to that. And so that is some of the things I've got going on. Excellent. So it was great having you. Okay. Thank you very much.